So it was Google Hangouts was making it crazy. Okay, so ecosystem service. So this is something that the organism does. that contributes to um, human life. So we'll just put humanity, right? And generally, this can actually be measured economically. So this could be an economic benefit. So like if the organism didn't do its ecosystem service, we would then have to spend money and time and resources trying to figure out how to do it, right? And so the ecosystem service that, there's actually two of them that the earthworm, earthworm helps in, is aeration of the soil. Right? And it also produces nutrients. And so as it breaks down microorganisms in the soil, it excretes nitrogen. So it each little segment actually excretes nitrogenous waste. And nitrogen in general is a limiting resource to plants. So plants need nitrogen to grow. And oftentimes we have to supplement soil using synthetic fertilizer right, but the earthworms are, can, can fertilize the plants with their nitrogenous waste, okay? So one of the really interesting things about earthworms in North America is, is that most of them are exotic. So most of the North American earthworms that you're familiar with, like if you think about night crawlers or just like you're digging around in your garden, what that earthworm is, is it is actually from Europe. So most earthworms that you think of are non-native, or sometimes that's referred to as exotic, right? So they are from Europe. So they came over with our European um, ancestors, right? They probably brought soil over with them that had eggs in it. So those are all non-native, um, but we they kind of taken um, over uh, the native earthworms that we have in our environment. So this is actually an example of a native earthworm, one that is native to what is referred to as the Palouse prairie. So example of a native earthworm is the Palouse prairie earthworm. And the Palouse prairie earthworm is a little bit larger than um, a typical earthworm, and it tends to be light in color. So here you can kind of see it's pink. And Palouse is um, the name for the ecosystem that is surrounding the kind of the foothill of the Blue Mountains. And if you dro drove north of here, like up towards Spokane, you kind of see these undulating, you know, uh, soils. And those are actually a special type of soil that is called loam. And it was blown here. So the wind actually carried the soil here, and then we get these rolling grasslands, which is what is called the Palouse. Now, those used to be covered with native grasses and native flowers. And there used to be native earthworms, too. But those have subsequently been replaced by wheat farms. Right? So this is actually thought to be, have thought to have been extinct, but they just recently discovered a few individuals. So we can say that it thought, was thought to be extinct. So like you could find examples of them in museums in Germany, right? They'd be in bottles. This is the Palouse prairie earthworm, you know, it's extinct. And then just a few years ago, Somebody found them in a remnant of Palouse Prairie up near uh, University, no, WSU, right? Washington State University. Uh, that's the one that's in Pullman, isn't it? Yeah. So they found one, a student found one. And so they're interested in seeing if they can find more, right? Unfortunately, 
the only places that they're found is kind of like in places where the um, farmers haven't been able to um, cultivate, right? So it could be just like maybe around the sides of the roads or maybe in ravines where cultivation hasn't um, been done in a while. And so this is what we would call the native earthworm. Now we also have some native earthworms, some giant ones in the Cascade Range that are really interesting that are kind of somewhat more similar to the giant earthworms that they see in Australia. So we do have our own in North America, large earthworms, not this big, but large earthworms in the Cascadia region. And so there's scientists that specialize in studying those um, populations of earthworm. And those would also be native to here. But your typical brown earthworm is a non-native. So we also have some examples of other annelids. And so if we look at the classes, you need to know three different classes of annelids. So this would be phylum annelida. So oligochaeta. Oligo means few. So this means that they have few bristles. And so this would be, for example, the earthworm. Okay, so all earthworms are in the class Oligochaeta, phylum Annelida. Now we do have some um, uh, segmented worms that have big bristles, and this would be an example of one. This is called a clam worm. And this is actually in the class Polychaeta. So kita means bristle, poly means many. And so this would be, for example, the clam worm. We also have the Christmas tree worm. And we have the tube worms, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Okay. So in the case of the clam worm, um, they use these to help move around, right? Clamworms can actually get really huge in the ocean. So these can be marine, and they can get up to be like 15 feet in length. They can get really big, right? And these little uh, bristles, um, also referred to as parapodia, they also use this in respiration, right? So they, they um, get oxygen across the surface of their body and specifically across the surface of these little parapodia. When we look at the um, Christmas tree worms, Okay. You can probably have seen these in movies featuring um, coral reefs, right? So these actually are the bristles, and these are filter feeders. So they use their bristles to filter food from the water, and if you come up near them, they will then take their bristles and they'll bring them in towards or into their tube, right? So that's the Christmas tree worm. And then we have other worms that here you can see the tube, and these bristle-like appendages. Um, are also used in, in, um, in uh, filter feeding. Now the tube worm, the giant tube worms, can be up to seven feet in length. And these are specifically um, located in or associated with deep sea, deep ocean thermal vents. So they're found near deep ocean thermal vents. And that's the same class? Yes, so this is polychaetes. So we're still at polychaetes. And they are really interesting because they're found in an environment where there is no sunlight. So scientists once thought that um, we were dependent upon, ecosystems were dependent upon, all ecosystems on the planet were dependent upon light from the sun. But these giant um, tube worms live so far down that there is no light. And so they are dependent upon a different type of um, energy production, which is called chemosynthesis. And so instead of sunlight, they use the chemicals that are coming out of the thermal vents, 
and in particular, they use hydrogen sulfide gas. So this would be H2S is hydrogen sulfide gas is used as a source of energy. So they do not have their no photosynthetic organisms down there. Instead of light. So if we look at the chemical equation, I'm not going to balance it, but it would be H2S plus CO2, and then you can get sugar. So they still use the carbon dioxide that is in the water, right? And they convert it to um, uh, glucose. So this is sugar that can be used as energy. So instead of sunlight, um, they use the H2S. And then this, this would be plus uh, water, plus sulfides. So they actually release the sulfides back, sulfur back into the ocean. Um, after they use it as a form of energy. And I have a video. Let me see if I can grab that video really quick here. So this would be another example. So on the midterm, I could ask you, what's an example of an acquired characteristic? The ability of chemosynthesis is actually due to the bacteria that live inside the um, that live inside the organism. So it isn't actually the tube worms themselves that can do it, but it is the symbiotic bacteria. So you want to write that down in your notes, that the symbiotic bacteria allows for this chemical reaction to take place. So this is an example of an endosymbiotic association relationship. Chemosynthetic bacteria have co-evolved with the giant tube worm, Lyptia pachytilla, in order to survive the harsh environment around deep ocean hydrothermal vents. In order for biosynthesis to occur, the worm must deliver key substrates to bacteria living inside the worm's trophosome. Hydrogen sulfide, oxygen, and carbon dioxide are taken in by the worm through a highly vascularized gill-like plume. Riptia pachytilla has evolved unique hemoglobins that allow it to bind both sulfide and oxygen. These substrates are delivered to specialized host cells called bacteriocytes, which contain the chemosynthetic bacteria. These bacteria use hydrogen sulfide and oxygen to produce energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate. This energy is used to convert carbon dioxide into organic compounds such as glucose. Glucose is then supplied to the host, either through bacterial excretion or direct digestion of the bacteria. Chemosynthetic bacteria make life around hydrothermal vents possible. This unique ecosystem can provide insights into the origin of life and perhaps clues to possible life on other worlds. So it's kind of amazing that these um, tube worm ecosystems can house even fish. So the, this, these guys would be at the base of the ecosystem and then like plants, right? So this is the base of the ecosystem. And then you have these giant blind fish and you have crabs and you have mussels and you have all kinds of other organisms that live within this ecosystem that is totally um, separate from any light source on the planet. So it's, it was a very amazing thing that happened. Okay, so let's look at the next group. So those were the polychaetes. Oops. We also have leeches. So leeches are in a separate class, and they are in the class Perudinae. So these would be the leeches. So they are very closely related to earthworms. However, they are ectoparasites. So instead of endoparasites, these guys attach to the outside of organisms and feed upon them. 
So as they're ectoparasites, they actually have a couple of interesting um, adaptations. So their saliva contains an anesthetic. So if you've ever had a leech on you, you'll know that you do not feel them. So it's kind of amazing. Like there's leeches in the Umatilla River and occasionally I'll get one on me, right? And it, I won't feel it. I won't even know it's on me. And then uh, when I pull it off, something else really amazing happens. The saliva not only deadens the skin um, sensation, but it also produces an anticoagulant. So what that does is that keeps the blood from clotting. So an anticoagulant will keep the blood from clotting. And um, so you take the leech off and you'll just bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed, right? And that's until your blood gets rid of all of the anticoagulants and then you can um, start, your blood will start to clot again. I mean, not a lot of blood, but anyway. So leeches have been used medicinally. Um, in the past, it wasn't so scientific. Um, in the past, you've probably have seen movies like in Europe where if you were sick, one of the things that they thought they would do is they would get rid of the bad sickness by bleeding, right? So bloodletting, um, leeches um, were used extensively. And actually, it's kind of interesting when you look at Europe, there's a lot of these medicinal leeches that are found in like ponds around Europe. And it's thought that it's because doctors use them. And then they just kind of put them in the pond. And so they kind of spread um, their uh, territory from where they would, uh, would have originated. So they kind of become invasive because we've distributed them throughout the landscape. Um, but they are sometimes used today because one of the good things about them is it's that they will be used medicinally to increase the blood flow to um, a site that um, um, is, has been damaged. So it could be like a severed appendage. So like in this case, it's on a person's thumb, right? But it could be like if you severed your thumb, not to pull blood into that if you were able to reattach it. And so you can put the, um, the leech here and then it will pull the blood into the appendage. And so sometimes they put them around wounds in order to increase the circulation around those those wounds. So we have medicinal leeches and you cannot personally buy them on the internet but uh, schools and research centers can, hospitals can buy them. Okay, so used medicinally to increase blood flow to a wound. Now these leeches are not only ectoparasites on invertebrates or vertebrates, but they can also you know, parasitize um, invertebrates. Um, but I have a little video that shows them parasitizing an amphibian. I think it's an amphibian, I think it's a newt. Let me see if I can. And in some cases, they could kill a small organism if they were to latch onto it. Okay. And, um, Oops, sorry. So sometimes they just kind of, um, when you're walking through the environment, they could be on shrubbery, for example, and they could reach out and, and be attracted to your warmth. But sometimes they actually go in and hunt. And so we're going to watch a leech that is actually hunting for its prey. But the internet's kind of spacey today. So here you can see that it actually has a, kind of a rasping teeth, right? So those are the teeth that would penetrate the surface of uh, um, the skin. 
And that is a newt that it's latched itself onto. And so if it took too much blood from that newt, it could potentially kill it. Right? But the newt's still alive, right? And so hopefully it will just take a little bit of blood and then detach and then the newt will be able to survive. So that's an example of a, that is actually a medicinal leech that they had in the lab that they were um, um, allowing to feed on some um, amphibians. Okay. Okay. Are there any questions about annelids? Segmented, true body cavity, complete digestive tract, and they're also protostomes. So we haven't talked about that. We talked about that in that video that I recorded. But remember that protostomes means that the first opening during embryonic, uh, embryonic development comes, becomes the mouth. Okay, so the next group is the phylum nematodes. So nematoda are the round worms. And they come next in, our, um, in one of our cladograms of the animals because they also have an exoskeleton. So they have an exoskeleton that is similar to arthropods. So it's composed of um, the polysaccharide chitin. So you might remember from previous classes, polysaccharide means that it is um, a sugar, a complex sugar. And the chitin, so this is actually very similar to say, for example, cellulose. But cellulose is only found in plants. Chitin is a structural sugar that is found in animals. So this is the same type of, of um, molecule that makes up say, for example, the exoskeleton of a shrimp. So when you peel the shrimp or when we peel the crayfish, that exoskeleton was composed of chitin. But the round worms are also have this exoskeleton. And so they are said to be ecdysozoans. And do you remember, I mentioned this before, what does ecdysis mean? What does ecdysis mean? It means shedding, right? Molting. To ecdysis means to come out of the ex exoskeleton, right? So it's an ecdysozoan, and I'll put along with arthropods. And this is in that handout that I gave you. Right, about that showed the two alternative phylogenies um, with all the different animal groups. I think I might have that on the next one. Put that up there. Oh, I didn't. Okay. So the nematodes have everything that the um, that the annelids have in terms of complexity. So they are bilaterally symmetric. Right. They have a brain. They also um, have a complete digestive tract, and they have a coelom. So they have a true body cavity. So it's very similar to the arthropods, but they are not segmented, okay? Actually, they have a false coelom, so we'll put that. They have a pseudo coelom, which means that they have a body cavity, but it is not completely lined with mesoderm. And we'll put that they're not segmented. Okay, so we have free-living nematodes. And there is a very famous free-living nematode called C. elegans. And C. elegans has been used extensively in research um, because it is very simple um, in that it only has like a thousand cells, but what they're able to do is to watch and how it goes from one cell to a thousand cells, and they've completely diagrammed out how the cells differentiate and where they go. 
So this is used extensively in understanding animal development. So I'll put important model for understanding animal development. So you go from one cell, they followed it all the way to like a thousand cells. And the cool thing is, is, is that they have a nervous system, they have a brain, they have skeletal muscle, right? They have muscle that they can consciously contract, they have smooth muscle, they have glands, they have everything that we do, but they're super simple, right? Only a thousand cells. So by understanding how they develop, we can better understand how we develop. So these guys are used extensively in labs. And so if we look at a picture of a C. elegans, this is used, uh, this is a picture taken using a scanning electron microscope so that they can actually see the outside of the organism, right? Um, these are microscopic, but if you were to look at them under a light microscope, oops, pictures back here. If you were look, to look at them underneath the light microscope, they look like this, right? So they're transparent, so you can actually see through them and see all of the different tissues that make up the organism. Okay, so they're really important. They're also important just like with um, um, earthworms in that they eat the soil, they eat the micro microorganisms in the soil, and then they excrete nitrogen. So they're important in soil health, okay? So we'll put important the um, problem, however, is is that not all nematodes are free living. In fact, if we looked at the vast majority of nematodes, they are parasitic. So we also have endoparasites. So these are endoparasites of animals and plants. So even plants can be hosts. Right? So if you went out to the animal uh, agricultural research station, or the, excuse me, the agricultural research station, like towards milk-free water, right? There's people that study nematodes in the soil and the nematodes that um, would attack particular plants. And so um, we apply to the soil, if we have parasitic nematodes, we apply nematocide. So this is a special type of pesticides that kills nematodes. And unfortunately, these would kill parasites but also free living nematodes. So the question would be, how can we promote normal healthy soil, right, that would have free living nematodes without um, uh, damaging or getting harmful parasitic nematodes um, that could decimate crops? Okay, so we have some examples in animals. So when you hear about heartworm, pinworm, pinworm interestingly is the most common uh, infection, parasitic infection in the United States. Pinworm is actually really, or can be common in children. This is a, uh, the adult lives in the intestine, and then interestingly at night, it migrates out and it lays its eggs around the anus. But when it migrates out through the anus, it becomes very itchy, right? So if you can imagine if you have a family of children and at night they're itching themselves, right? And then the eggs get on their hands and the eggs get on the bedding, right? And then they can actually ingest the eggs and then the parasite completes its life cycle, right? So that's the pinworm. That's the most common parasitic worm we have in um, the United States. Heartworm, when you think about dogs, dogs can be prone to heartworm, okay? And then there's one that 
um, used to be common in the southern United States, but been, has largely been eradicated. And this is hookworm. Okay. Hookworm has, um, is interesting because it has actually been proposed that um, by purposefully being infected with hookworm, you might actually be able to cure some human illness and diseases, including things like autoimmune diseases or things like allergies and asthma. Okay, so if we look at the hookworm in particular, oops, I went backwards. Next page. Okay. So hookworms worldwide are the most common um, infection worldwide in, in roundworms. And this um, means that, let's see, how many people are there on the planet? There's over 7.5 billion, I think. So 1.3 billion people carry hookworm. And so when we look at its life cycle, it is an example of an endoparasite where the adult lives in the intestine. The eggs leave with the feces, and they hatch out into larvae on the soil. So they larvae live in the soil. And then the larvae burrow in through the soles of the foot. Generally, it could be anything that comes in contact with the soil, okay? Now it's in the circulatory system. So when it gets into the circulatory system, it could go right to the digestive system, but it doesn't. Interestingly, it takes a different route. So it goes to the lungs. So it comes to the lungs, and it's coughed up and swallowed. So it doesn't go right to the gut. Now, one problem that it can cause is anemia. Because just like the leech, it is actually feeding upon the blood, kind of latches onto the tissue and just kind of feeds on the blood of its host. And so anemia, anemia means that you don't have enough oxygen carrying capacity in your body. And so this can make you weak and tired. So in the southern United States, it was a big deal, um, like in the 1930s, 1940s, because people were chronically anemic because of hookworm infection. And so Southerners were thought to be lazy and lethargic and slow. And so it's, this really interesting story behind the eradication of hookworm is, is that the Rockefeller Institute actually sent scientists down to um, the Southern United States to figure out what was wrong with all these Southerners. Why were they so lazy? And it came back that the, a lot of them were infected with hookworm. And so then there became a um, campaign to clean up the um, hygiene. So rather than having, you know, outhouses that weren't, didn't have really deep, you know, um, they weren't buried very deep. If you look at this, as long as you have an outhouse and you get your feces down far enough, far enough I think it's like three feet, four feet, then the larvae can never make it to the surface of the soil in order to um, come up and um, burrow into the, can never actually complete this, the cycle, its life cycle, right? So Rockefeller was, um, um, the, in the institute, was um, the people that spent the money to do the research and to figure out how to educate people about um, how to deal with feces, and then they made everybody dig outhouses, right? So, and maybe indoor plumbing, right? <laughs> So outhouses and indoor plumbing became a big deal, okay? Okay, so however, there is this new theory 
that um, we have actually eliminated too many of our parasites. And that might be the reason why we're seeing an increase in certain diseases in our society. So the um, hypothesis is, is that the hookworms might be beneficial. So we'll see. It's be beneficial. And in order to understand why they might be beneficial, right, we have to understand our immune system. So there's actually a part of our immune system that is devoted to fighting off these parasites. And if you take away the parasites, then the immune system actually will start to, to attack normal healthy tissue or will start to cause problems, right? And so the idea is, is that um, um, without parasites, autoimmune diseases like celiac disease, like um, what multiple sclerosis, like some really bad diseases like lupus, okay, autoimmune diseases may be more common. And also, asthma and allergies might be more common as well. And you think about allergies and you're like, well, that's probably not so bad, but those autoimmune diseases could be really bad. So if you had like rheumatoid arthritis, where your immune system is attacking your joints and causing disfigurement and inability and lots of pain, right? The idea of, of being subjected to a few hookworms is not so probably far out there, right? So the idea is, is that maybe you could subject a person with these diseases, right? And give them 10 hookworms. And if you gave them 10 hookworms, um, then those hookworms would reside in the gut for a few years before they died. And if, if you look back at that life cycle, so let's say that we gave a person um, 10 hookworms here. Notice that their life cycle has to complete in order to get more. So it's not like those 10 hookworms could multiply and you could have 1,000 hookworms in you, right? You will only retain those 10 hookworms because your feces are being flushed down the toilet, right? They're being subjected to... Um, sterilization or you know they they kill all the back, bad bacteria and then the water's reintroduced right and so really thinking about it um, it could possibly be a treatment for some of these diseases and it's interesting um, in some countries like in Mexico and some European countries you can actually order um, this hookworms and um, via the mail, right? And they come as larvae, and you just put them on the surface of their skin, and they burrow in, and then they'll go to your lungs, and you'll cough them up, and then they'll get your digestive tract, and then you're, you have your forms, okay? They haven't um, agreed to allow people to buy hookworms in the United States, however, so you'd have to go to Mexico to get it, right? Okay. Are there any questions about that idea, that perhaps we are too clean Perhaps we have lost the parasites that um, might um, help us, um, and specifically in this case, dampen down some immune responses. Okay. Last parasite we're going to talk about. This is the filarial endoparasite. This is the this is called the filarial worm, and the filarial worms include worms that cause elephantiasis. Okay, so this is a filarial worm disease. So this is the disease elephantiasis. And instead of living in the digestive tract, this filarial worm lives in the lymphatic system. So the adult lives in the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system drains excess fluid 
That's L-Y-M-P-H, let me spell that better, lymphatic system. So it drains excess fluid that you lose in your circulatory system, right? So this causes extreme swelling or edema. So what happens if left untreated, you can treat this. So if you went to Asia or you went to Africa and you got this filarial worm and your, your appendages started to swell, you could treat yourself and the swelling would go down. But if it's left un untreated, it can actually cause permanent damage to the lymphatic vessels. And so there's some pictures of people that have these extreme cases of it. So this would be an example of a person with an extreme case, right? Multiple areas where the adult resides. And this isn't like a tumor or anything, this is tissue. So it concludes like muscle, you know, it's, it's the fluid surrounding the cells that are all swollen up. So you can't really go in and just amputate, it's not like just cutting out a tumor, right? This is the, 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 or the man's limb, right? And so this is extreme case, right? So if we look at how these um, get, now we, d we don't have the ability to just put our eggs in the feces. So how does one adult get from the lymphatic system to another? And so in this case, we have the larvae travel. So the larval worm travels to the skin at night. What happens at night that might help you transmit a larva from one person to another? What comes out at night that is so annoying? Mosquitoes, right? So the reason why the larvae travel to the skin is, is that in order to complete their life cycle, they have to be picked up by a mosquito. So they're picked up by a mosquito and they don't do any development in the mosquito and so the mosquito is considered a vector. So it just simply transports the larvae from one individual to the next, okay? So the larvae, right, the larvae um, are injected into the next host. with a mosquito bite. So this one's kind of scary because you could just pick up a filarial worm through a mosquito bite, right? So that's why they recommend that, that you protect yourself from mosquitoes, right? Because mosquitoes can be disease vectors. Most notably, the Zika virus is also transmitted via a, a mosquito, right? So mosquitoes are hard, um, are hard organisms to avoid. Um, but you can take um, so there's a cure for this, right? So you just take a nematicide. So you can just take a drug that kills the, um, uh, the adults in your body, and then they just essentially, you get broken down and removed from the body. And um, unless there has been permanent damage done to the lymphatic system, the swelling will go away. So it's not so bad that you can't get rid of the swelling if you are if you have medical treatment available to you. Yes. Okay, so these are tropical. So Africa and Asia, primarily South America. So they would not live here um, because of our cold winters. Okay, so those are all endoparasites. Those are nematodes, not to be confused with the flatwor flatworms, right? So we talked about flatworms, nematodes, um, and those both being um, having lots of different examples of endoparasites. Does anybody know what this is? This is a fossil, but it's a fossil of a very famous group of organisms. It's not around today, so it's extinct. 
even know what it's called. Okay. They're very, very common fossils because one of the things that allows them to fossilize is their exoskeleton. So what we see is we see these are examples of trilobites. Have you heard of trilobites? Okay, these are extinct arthropods. So we're now in the next phylum, which is arthropoda. Okay, so these are extinct arthro oops, extinct arthropods. So one of the things that characterizes them, so remember it's kind of weird. We went from annelids to nematodes that are not. Annelids are segmented, nematodes are not but arthropods are, but it's because of the molecular data that shows that uh, roundworms and arthropods are more closely related than annelids and arthropods. So arthropoda. So characteristics is, is that they are segmented, right? And the segments have uh, become fused. in many different groups, okay. They also have an exoskeleton composed of chitin. Even though chitin is made up of glucose, we cannot digest it. So it's kind of like cellulose, how animals, like we can take in grass, but it's not digestible. The cellulose in, in plants is not digestible. We cannot digest the chitin. Um, so even though there's glucose present in that, that's not um, something that we can, um, our enzymes can break down. So generally when we eat, we eat shellfish, for example, or we eat crayfish, or we eat those kinds of organisms, we take the shell. Crabs, for example, we take the shell off. Okay. The exoskeleton um, is also um, hard, and it must be shed in order for the organism to, um, to grow. So it is hard, and it is heavy, and it must be shed, must be molted for the organism to grow. So unlike our endoskeleton, if we had an exoskeleton, it would be way too heavy for our size. So the reason why we don't see like land beetles, you know, the size of pigs or the size of cows is because if you scale them up, a beetle the size of a cow would be, their exoskeleton would be so heavy that they would just be kind of like, wouldn't be able to move, right? So the large arthropods are the ones that are in the ocean. So we can see these lobsters, which are get pretty big, they don't get as big as a cow, but the lobsters get pretty big because they actually are supported by the water, right? So they're kind of buoyant. So they can grow larger in the ocean, in the water, aquatic environment, than they can grow on land. We do have some pretty big beetles, you know, maybe the size of my hand, right? In the tropical rainforest, there's these huge beetles that. They're kind of funny, they fly around and they look like a little um, car, you know, like out of Harry Potter flying, you know, they kind of fly, little toy car flying through the, the rainforest. Okay, so if we look at the exoskeleton, in order for the new endoskeleton to form, so this is the old exoskeleton, it has to be soft and it has to be folded so that it can be bigger, right? So this is my new exoskeleton. So the um, exoskeleton has to split, and there's, there are particular seams, like down the back of the body where the exoskeleton splits, and then the organism has to remove itself, extricate itself from the old exoskeleton 
And then the new exoskeleton is kind of interesting because it is pale in color. So if you ever see like a beetle, right, or any kind of insect that looks white and you're like, why is that white, right? That looks kind of weird. It's because they have just recently molted and they so that their exoskeleton hasn't hardened so they're very susceptible um, to like touching or to damage to their exoskeleton and they haven't yet got their pigmentation right so any newly molted arthropod will be light in color so they're very vulnerable at the time of molting right so a lot of organisms you know protect themselves during molting Sometimes these, in, this includes spiders. Sometimes spiders will create a whole little case and they'll molt inside the case and then when they leave, they leave their old exoskeleton behind. So if you've ever taken like a, um, a silk case and pulled it apart and you're like, oh, this has got spider parts in it, right? But if it looks like it's just the exoskeleton, it was probably a molting cocoon that they made, right? And then they just kind of crawled out of. And so this is kind of a disadvantage to having an exoskeleton is you have to molt it and then it's your period of really extreme vulnerability, okay? So these are disadvantages. Okay, one advantage to having a exoskeleton obviously is protection after it is hardened, right? And also it helps to prevent water loss. Right. So we see um, uh, insects coming from aquatic environment, they evolved in the aquatic environment and then coming onto land. And so they're one of the first group of invertebrates that came onto the land, right? So they're able to colonize the terrestrial environment. And live in extreme environments. Some of them maintain aquatic lifestyle. Some of them have a larval aquatic lifestyle and then they metamorphose and become adults like dragonflies. The larval dragonflies are, live in the water. So if we look at the different groups of arthropods, arthropods groups, right? And this is the, the most number of species are in this group, right? Most um, number of species. So in terms of species, this is actually the age of the arthropods, not of the mammals, right? or not even of vertebrates. We are in the age of the arthropods. So arthropod, arthro means jointed. So these guys have jointed appendages as well, right? So they have jointed appendages. And sometimes those jointed appendages determine what group they are found in. Also, how many segments they have. Okay. So, we could talk about hexapoda. What do you think that means? What does hex mean numerically? Six, what does poda mean? Feet, right? Six legs, what organisms have six legs? Insects. Okay. So all of the groups of insects, six legs, hexapoda. Okay. We also have another group called the myria poda. And I think a myria is like, I don't know what that means, but I think a lot, right? So a myriad, a lot of different legs. And so this would include the centipedes, which I'll show you a picture of in a second and the millipedes. Myria poda. Okay. We also have the Chelicera 
formies. So chelicera is a special type of jointed appendage. The chelicera is the appendage on the spider that makes it so that it actually um, has poison. It's the, it's the poisonous appendage that um, injects the poison into its prey. But this would include spiders. It also includes scorpions. And this is a really weird one, the horseshoe crab is in the Chelicera formies. The other crabs are in a different group. So besides the horseshoe crab, if you think of just your typical crab, it is in the phylum, or the subphylum, excuse me, the subphylum crustacea. These are all arthropods, crustacea. So this would include shrimp, lobster. This also includes um, crab. This also includes most zooplankton. So zooplankton are animals that are tiny little organisms that float in the ocean. And so an example of zooplankton is krill. So you might have heard how important krill are specifically to some large organisms like baleen whales that just travel through the ocean and have this huge baleen, which is actually just like a big net up these small microscopic organisms and that's all they eat on and they're these huge massive mammals okay so those are the crustaceans now there is um, a um, um, let's put crustaceans sorry crustacean there is in our environment and they might have played with as a child does anybody know what that is? It's a terrestrial crustacean. Nope, nope, it's terrestrial. So it's like, if you like looked around in the soil, you would see it crawling in the soil. Roly poly, right? Or sometimes, what do they call them here? Peel, pill bugs? Peel bugs, potato bugs or pill bugs or whatever. Roly polies, pill bugs, those are actually crustaceans. So let's just look at a few of these. Oops. Okay. So this is an example of a millipede. Millipedes are um, different from centipedes in the fact that they look like they have more legs, but that is simply because the um, appendages have fused together so it looks like, or there is, two um, sets of appendages per segment. So the segments have just fused. And so it looks like they have a million legs. But the millipedes are actually herbivores. And so you don't have to worry. You can play with the millipedes, right? And so in the tropical rainforest, these millipedes can get really large. Like they could get the length of your hand, and they could be like this big, right? And they, you can handle them because they don't have poison glands. The other myriapoda are the, um, these would be the centipedes. You don't want to play with centipedes, right? Because they have poison glands. And they are carnivorous. And they have only one set of appendages per segment. So they look like they have only a hundred legs, not a million legs. That's why they're called centipedes. These are the poison glands located up near the head. They have eyes and then they have these antennae. So they actually are little hunters in the soil. And so um, they could potentially inject you with their toxin. It's not, the centipedes right we have around here are not that, all that poison, but in some parts of the world they are very poisonous and we don't wanna get bit by them. 
so this is actually the horseshoe crab and there's a there's a interesting article if you want to read about it I've posted on the canvas website that talks about um, the milk they actually have blue blood and they actually um, as part of the pharmaceutical industry um, once a year they capture them and they bleed them and their blue blood is, is believed to be really um, important in the treatment of disease and so it has some really interesting I think it's anti-cancer properties um, so um, those are the these would be chelicerae they are related um, to the spiders This is also some examples of the chelicerae formes. These are the chelicerae on your scorpion. I didn't mention that mites also are have these chelicerae structures, right? And then spiders have chelicerae, and the chelicerae are um, in spiders contain the toxin, their venom, spider venom is in the chelicerae. Also notice that spiders can be distinguished from insects because they have eight legs. So there'd be one, two, three, four, right? Four sets of legs rather than six. Okay. So that's the way you can always tell the difference between spiders, if it's a spider or if it is an insect. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about spiders. Spiders are all carnivorous. So they have um, a, um, they produce toxin. And um, they also produce silk. And silk is really interesting. It starts out in their bodies as a liquid. And as it moves through the silk gland, it becomes a solid because of a change in pH. So um, the, the silk glands are usually at the end of the organism, at the end of the organism's abdomen. And so they store it as liquid. And then as it moves out, it becomes really acidic. And then the protein actually comes out of solution and it makes a solid. But the silk is really cool because it is extremely strong, right? So we're trying to like, synthetically produce silk because we think that it would be really useful in building machines and, and other things um, because it is so strong. So if we look at what they use their silk for, right, we have web building. We produce or they produce egg cases. I also mentioned sometimes they produce molting cases. And then they have a really um, wonderful, I think, um, uh, method of dispersing of their offspring. So um, in the dispersal of the offspring, they have a mechanism that is called ballooning. So what happens after the offspring are, um, are hatch out is they kind of sit on the top of vegetation and a wind comes by and then they let loose a strand of silk and that just carries them. So that strand, they kind of fly through the air in that strand of silk and then they come down in a new environment and then they, um, uh, then they are away from their parents so they're not competing with their parents, not competing with their other offspring that are produced. And so it's just a dispersal mechanism. So sometimes in the, in specifically in like the fall or in the late summer, you probably have looked out over a field and have seen all these strands of silk floating by, right? That's the ballooning of the offspring. Not all of the, um, of the spiders um, are web builders um, to capture prey. Some of them are sit and wait predators, but some of them are actually um, more active predators. And so one example that is my favorite, um, one of my favorite invertebrates is the jumping spider. So jumping spiders are kind of the ecological equivalent 
of cats in their environments. In that, they hunt their prey. They have complex eyes, um, and specifically, it's a single lens eye. And this is important because this can see images. We'll talk about insects, not today, but on Wednesday. Um, but the um, insects have complex compound eyes that have multiple lenses, and they're really good at seeing movement, but they are not really good at seeing images. But other spiders, jumping spiders included, have single lens eyes, so they actually are very visual, right? And so um, they also use um, movement of their legs, and so they kind of communicate by moving their legs. So they communicate to one another through leg movements. Okay, let me see if I can find one video. Yes, so peacock spiders are jumping spiders. They're grouped as a jumping spider. Are they big spiders or are they small? Um, the, they can be really small. These are the ones that you see that are really fuzzy. They're black and they're really fuzzy. I'll show you the most common ones. So the most common jumping spiders that we have around here is a species called Phidipidus audax, and it looks like this. Oops. So this is an adult. Right, these are these single lens eyes, and they can actually track your movement. Um, so if you have one in your house, sometimes you walk through the room and they actually turn and they watch you move, right? Because they're watching, tracking your movement. And then they have these white fuzzy legs with these patterns because they communicate to one another by like lifting their arms like this, right? And they actually discovered this, this kind of an interesting story. When I was a graduate student, another graduate student discovered um, this because they were watching television and they had their jumping spiders in a terrarium and they were watching and all the spiders were lined up and they were actually watching the television screen, the images on the television screen. So the students had a really uh, interesting idea that he would put little television screens in the terrarium with little stick spiders going like this, right? And so he would like make the spider go like that and the spider would go like that back. Right, and it would make it go like that, and it would respond differently. And so they seem to be responding to one another. Courtship is big, so the males will move their legs in order to try to woo a female into um, mating with them. And different jumping spiders will have different um, sets of movements that they that they use to communicate. Okay, so they're real visual predators. Yeah, I have to show you that video next time. I can't get my computer to work over there. So the other thing I wanted to mention about spiders is that there's a difference between males and females. So males, female spiders tend to be larger than males. So this is still under spiders. They tend to be larger. Sometimes they're much, much larger than the males, but not always. In jumping spiders, the female's just a little bit larger than the males. And the males have a special appendage. So the males have a modified front appendage. Called a pedipelp. Females do not have pedipelps. Okay. So if I was looking at this uh, spider, I would note this front appendage, and this is not a pedipelp. This is just a, a leg um, that they use for feeling around, right? They might actually help them 
feed, for example. But in the male, this is enlarged. So the pedipalp looks like this. So if I was to draw a pedipalp, it would look like a little boxing glove, right? So it's kind of like that. So this would be the male. And then the female would just have a palp that looks like this. So that would be the female. So if you wanted to sex a mature spider, you would see if the spider has those pedipalps, and then you would know that it is a male. Right? So this is really interesting because this has to do with um, uh, sexual reproduction. And specifically, it has to do with the transfer of sperm. So because the females are carnivores, the males do not want to get very close to them. And specifically, they don't want to have to uh, use their genitalia to insert the sperm. So male spiders um, ejaculate the sperm into a special web. Then they suck the sperm up with their pedipalp. And they use the pedipalp to insert the sperm. Right. So the female's reproductive organ and the male's are both on the, the bottom of their abdomen. So if you imagine if they had to copulate directly, the male would have to get like his whole body would have to be close to the females, right? That's really dangerous for him because he could be eaten, right? He could um, have poison, the, the female could attack him. So what he does instead is he uses his pedipalp and he just kind of sneaks up to the female and he will just insert his pedipalp, sticking it out, insert his pedipalp into the female's reproductive tract, kind of keeping her at a distance, right? So it is said to be an example of um, indirect copulation. So this is an example of indirect copulation where males use a structure other than their genitalia in order to transfer the sperm. This is not how insects reproduce. Insects, the males have a copulatory structure like a penis, and they insert it directly into the female. But spiders have evolved, male spiders have evolved this different strategy. OK, so we'll stop there for today. And then we're going to finish up on invertebrates and hopefully start on vertebrates. So things like lamprey and hayfish. On there is a quiz on Wednesday as well. So the quiz on Wednesday will be over the information from last Wednesday and today only. And my computer would not record the lecture, so I apologize. That lock. Those groups are in the garden or in the microscopic? They are microscopic, but it kind of is each. Okay. Because your immune system goes. There's something in there that's not supposed to be in there, and it releases histamine, so it causes redness and swelling in my kitchen. Um, I'll post a video. There's actually a guy, there's a video of a guy actually getting purposely infected with a fly. And then it describes what it's like. It actually might be already there. Can I see what they're trying to do with the fish now? Yeah. The military is looking into trying to figure out how to make a synthetic sort of ooze like what they create. Oh, yeah, the mucus. Because it's got um, sort of the same properties as like Kevlar as well as like how it's held together. So oh, they're trying to do new like ballistic testing with it. Cool. Yeah. That's what the military is looking for. Yeah.